Hi guys, Coach Joe Michella, 2012 Olympic team coach in the sport of Olympic weightlifting. I've had over 24 years of experience working with high level Olympic weightlifters. And I've been asked you know, numerous times that what does it take to be successful in the sport of Olympic weightlifting? There's things of measurable and quantifiable um, factors that we can look at. And there's also those, you know, factors that are not measurable. You know, we, the biggest thing that we love to have is that an athlete just has just natural strength. That lifting and gaining strength just comes extremely natural to them. And it's hard, you know, people go, well, how do you measure that? It's just that, you know, all right, the first day in the gym, you know, they, you know, can lift, you know, 180 kilo front squat. Yes, or is this not only that immediately, but it's their rate of development. You know, we have certain graphs that we would look at in terms of their rate of improvement and how quickly, you know, an athlete, you know, would improve in terms of their strength gains in a standard program. And then we would have basically three lines. You know, you basically have a line that someone is just like a sponge and they're just kind of making linear progression and it just seems like incremental, you know, weekly gains, okay? that are kind of uh, seen at a faster rate of development. And for example, it could be that, you know, they did a 20 kilo uh, movement one week, next thing you know, they're doing, you know, 30 or 40 kilos. And the week after that, it's 40, 50 kilos, and then 60, 70 kilos. Not that it's continuing to go up, but it almost seems at this, this stepping stone rate. Whereas the next line, you would see someone just a little bit more slow and steady and gradual. The gains are coming, but they may just be slower and over a more of an extended period of time, you know, so that they're, they're doing well and they're learning the sport and they're getting better at it, but it's not, you know, you know, obviously impressive that they're just shooting up. And then there's the kid that just kind of stays stagnant, you know, and they're just going like, hey, we've done everything, we've gained weight, we lost weight, and they're just not really making that, that linear improvement. And that could be not only over a month, but that could be over several months, but also we look at it over a year span. In reality, we're looking at a year and a four year period of time. What is that rate of development? And then we factor in their age. When did they come into the sport and how's that rate of development? So obviously if you have a kid that's 12 or 14, there should be this natural jumping up of their development, mainly because of puberty. You know, as they're going through puberty, hormones are coming into their body, they're adding the stress of training, they should be adapting. So you can see these huge gains. Well, now we wanna see, all right, they stopped at puberty. So now they're at 16 or 17 or 18 years old. Now is that other factor of that 18 to 22 year age of business, even though they're pretty much done puberty, most of them, you know, you're still in this Goldilocks zone of development. So you should still see a linear jump in improvement. You know, well now you got them at 22, okay? Now, what does that rate look like? Is it now one or two kilos a year? or they're making still 20 kilo improvements. Eventually it's gonna slow down and eventually it's gonna stop. But we're looking to see, you know, we had an athlete, his name was Nate Zerwinski. Early on, he started coming to us about 15, 16 years old and we were tracking his rate of improvement every six months to a year period of time. And he was on this trajectory chart that he was improving 30 to 40 kilos every major block of period of time. And that was saying, all right, you know, but it wasn't, now compared it to a guy like a CJ Cummings who was coming, he was doing double that. He was now c jumping up 50 to 60 kilos of improvement every uh, marketable period of time. Both had gains, but one was on that, what we call that special trajectory mark, and one was on that more slow and steady. And then we've had other athletes, not gonna say their names, but they were like, hey, uh, you've been at the same weights for the last six months to a year. We're trying to figure out why. Well, they're just heavy, coach. I'm like, okay, you know, let's eat more. Boom, let's get more sleep. Boom, nothing changed, okay? Whereas a guy like a Nate Zerwinski or a guy like CJ Cummings, even though I didn't train CJ personally, <clears throat> but following his progress over time, he was on the exceptional category. And then another kid was on the more of the slow and steady. They were making those improvements over time. So we look at those things. Does they, re do they recover fast? You know, that if you gave them a very high training load throughout the week or through a training um, four week phase of training, how did their body recover? You know, how did they come back? Did they come back and go, coach, I'm done, I'm dead. And they need three weeks to recover from that four weeks. Or they took like a half a day and they're like, I'm good. You know what I mean? And you're going, wow, this athlete, not only they're making these jumps in improvement from a strength standpoint and a technical adaptation standpoint, but 
Part of that is because they recover so fast, you know, naturally. So you're going like, well, well, if they can recover that fast, that means that we can stay in a higher zone of performance versus in a lower zone of recovery and maintenance. So that's another factor that we, we look at. You know, does this athlete, can they have these, these periods of recovery? Can they do an evening workout to a morning workout and it doesn't totally destroy them? You know, or does it and they're going, wow, that just beat me up and I can't do back to backs. I can't do back to back workouts. I need a day, a full day rest in between. We've had some athletes that have made a transition from their, their club programs into our national program and they were training three, maybe four days a week with significant rest periods in between. And then they got to our national training center when we had it back in the day. And now they were asked to do nine to 12 workouts a week and double workouts in some days plus an additional you know, conditioning session and their bodies just couldn't handle it. Now, where they progressed into it, I can't say 100% or they were just thrown into the fire. Either way, their bodies didn't adapt 100% and we had more than not, we had some athletes that just kind of folded under those situations, you know, because they were just, body just needed more rest. And then I had other athletes, again, that adapted that very well. So the athletes that adapted that well, now they can train heavier, more frequently. And that adaptation allowed for better technique and allowed for, um, you know, faster gains. We also see those athletes who just need longer rest. They're making progress, they just need a different rest interval, okay? I just recently was at the Senior National Championships, had a, a, a conversation with Steve Fowler, who is Olivia Reeves, Olympian, Olivia Reeves' coach, and he was like, yeah, she doesn't train that often. You know what I mean? She's not doing these, you know, nine and 12 sessions a week kind of thing, but it works for her. What I establish the entire national program based off of what Olivia can do? No. Just like you wouldn't base it off of like one person that could handle, you know, 15 sessions, you know, in a given week. You know, they may be an exception. You need to be some kind of, you know, happy medium and balance and find what works, you know, for you and your system of training. But we look at those measurables of, like I said, certain height, certain weight. We look at bone structure, anthropometric measurements, you know, Shoulder width, hip width, hand size. I remember a Bulgarian coach friend of mine used to say in Bulgaria, they would look at their hands and look at their thumbs. They would see, all right, what does this kid's hands look like at a very young age? Are they gonna be able to grab the bar? You know, they're gonna have this bone structure in their hands. You know, and our former national coach would talk about doing testing and look at, you know, tenacity, you know, everything from running sprints to, you know, all out rep bench press test to see who's gonna struggle and try to get that extra rep. You know, who's gonna sprint, you know, at the end or they're just gonna like lay up a little bit because they wanna see then the unmeasurables which is heart and desire and fight. You know, you could have all the best tangibles, you're five nine, you're this, your bone structure is perfect, you got great straight teeth and it's like, you got no heart and balls, okay? So then what? We've seen a lot of times that athletes have possessed unbelievable physical talent but then we put him out there in either a major competition or major international competition or even a major national competition and they shit the bed. You know, they don't have it mentally. They don't have that mental discipline, you know, and that's tough. You know, they don't have that mental fortitude to push themselves because either A, it's always came so easy to them and the second they now get challenged, they just are not used to it. Or two, they don't truly love it. They don't truly love and care about what they're doing to really now put their body out there and make those sacrifices. And we've seen that as well, you know? So then we have these things where we have these people that are just game day um, lifters as well. They may go, you know, they come into training and they're like, man, they're kind of like sandbagging it. They're kind of half-assing it, you know? But then they show up in competition, lights turn on and then you, you go. We had an athlete many, many years ago. It was a female athlete. She never clean and jerked 100 kilos in, uh, in training. We get the competition. She's like, I can open with this. And I'm like, what are you nuts? We've never, you never hit it in training. And it took me a while to like let her basically talk me into it. And then we did. And then she went boom, boom, boom. And she would make two, or th two out of three or three out of three clean and jerks. And I'm going, she never can make this in training. And she's like, I would be like, why? Like, why can't you do this in training? Because then I could at least give me an idea of what you're capable of doing in a competition. She's like, it's just this feeling of other people watching me turns me into a situation that I am more, you know, excited. So it's the, that um, good pressure of other people watching. But, uh, you know, that's, that's a huge thing. You know, I know there was a, a famous story one time about um, 
a coach in another country where they're training, it was predominantly a male team, and they're training, they're training, they're training, and everyone was just kind of, at some point, going through the motions, and he's trying to figure out different ways to motivate them. He had this idea, he's like, you know what, I'm gonna go down to the local college, and I'm gonna round up about 20 of the prettiest girls I can find, and I'm gonna tell them to come down, and they're not gonna say anything, they're just gonna sit in the back of the room, and they're just gonna watch these guys train. And it was a day they were gonna go heavy, and he didn't tell them they were coming in, and next thing you know, they all got dressed up, they're all dressing nice, they're all cute. They come in and he sits them all in the back of the gym, doesn't even say anything. Everyone that day, all the guys basically outlifted what they were supposed to do that day because they were there to impress. They were there, they had external motivation to turn it on. Now, some people's motivation is a pretty girl. Some of it is money. Some of it is the love of your family. Some of it is, you know, for other factors that they got going on in their life, you know. But whatever it is, you gotta find that. Those are those unmeasurables, okay? Sometimes it's, not, it's gonna take you several sessions, years, you know, major competitions for you to find out who you got, you know, as, as a athlete and a coach. So that you can now put together those quantifiable things. All right, they have the skill set. They have the, the strength. They have, you know, this perfect body type that we want or what we think can get them to a certain level. And now we have to add some of those external things. What motivates them to get them to lift that barbell. It can maybe just be the confidence of you as the coach in them that they could do it. It may be a word from their, their significant other. It may be, you know, there's monetarily something on the line. You know, there's the, the goal of immortality of becoming an American record holder or, you know, a senior, uh, America, a senior international record holder. That, to do something that no one else has done before. You know, to have that sense of pride. You know, as a coach, you're trying to find those things. There's one thing I'm, da I'm dangling the, the proverbial carrot in front of them of going for a PR, but how can I get them there to that PR? You know, how can that coach? And what type of athletes do you want? Do you constantly want the athlete that's constantly motivated by money? I don't know, you know, I don't know. There has to be this fine balance because then it's like, well, what happens the money's not there? Are they just not gonna do it? We've seen that before, you know, we've seen that where an athlete's not motivated to do this because of the, the financial gain in the situation and it's like, they're like, why am I doing this, you know? You know, I could be doing something else. And then you put that on the table and it's like, okay, now they're gonna do it. So you have to find that as a coach, you have to find that with ticks. So again, we're looking for that athlete that has that internal motivation, but also can get motivated by something externally, the roar of the crowd, you know, representing Team USA, you know, getting that medal around their neck. You know, those are some of the things we want. We don't want that person, you know, that just occasionally shows up, you know, that just occasionally shows up for that competition, you know? Because again, as a coach, it's hard for us to gauge who we're gonna get, you know? Who we're gonna get that day of? Are you gonna get the guy that balls out? Or are you gonna get the guy or the girl that, you know, is like, you know, they're not really that motivated today, you know what I mean? So we want someone, as a coach, we want someone who's, who, who, who loves it and cares about it. Now, do you have to eat, sleep, and shit weightlifting? Not 100%, you know? Some of the better people that I ever took to some of the highest level competitions, some of them didn't even know what the frig they were doing. They were like, you know, I kind of like doing this, you know. I'm just really good at it, you know. I've heard that more than not about some of our top people, whether it was my personal people or people we had on teams. They were just kind of like, I'm good at this and I'm doing it for now. You know what I mean? And then something else comes up, you know, I'll probably go do that. Those are hard people, you know. It's hard for people, for, for a coach who's a lifer who's been in it, to kind of go, you know, you're so talented. If you cared a little bit more, if you give a shit a little bit more, how much further you can go in the sport you know, and do things that no other people can do. So that's kind of hard. And then you got the people that are diehards, but they just don't have that physical and tangible. They do everything you ask them to do. You know, they take their Flintstone vitamins, they sleep, they lift, they do everything, but they just can't make that progress. They can't take that jump from good to great, you know, physically. Their body just can't do it. Their body just can't, it hits this, this ceiling. And it's frustrating because you're like, hey, they, they do everything for you. Um, but they just don't have that. They don't have that Usain Bolt kind of speed. They don't have that Bo Jackson type of athletic ability. You know, that's tough. And then you get a kid, like I said, in Team USA right now, like a Hampton Morris. Like Hampton puts all the work in. He does all the, the recovery. He does all the little things. You know, is he physically gifted? Yes. Is he our most physically gifted guy? No. But he, he has this balance of he's better than most, but he does all the little things and leaves no stone unturned. Olivia Reeves, I'm not saying she doesn't train hard, I don't know her that well, but she has a physical gift that her strength just keeps getting better. You know, and that breeds them more confidence in her that she can do more. 
You know, I'm not saying she, she's eating cheeseburgers and, you know, staying up late and doing crazy stuff. I don't know that about her. But I'm just saying, like, you have different types of people approaching it different ways. Hampton probably trains double the amount of time as hers. Not that it's a negative thing. It works for him. He likes that structure, the order, and the discipline. Olivia, she trains three to four days a week. Whatever it may be, she trains that because that works best for her. You know, like I said, now it's finding that hap happy medium. <clears throat> so there's, like I said, whether, again, if that athlete never trains super heavy or that athlete trains heavy all the time, finding what works for them, again. But finding those athletes, again, that have that natural gift. I used to be asked a long time ago, would you take someone that can just picks up Olympic lifting technically really solid and has great mobility and flexibility, but is, not, is lacking in the natural strength standpoint? Or would you ha like to have someone who's just a big, strong animal that is just so strong that everything comes easy to them, but maybe they're lacking a little bit on the technical side. Before my, early in my career, I was like, you know what? I always want someone who's technically sound. I'll make them stronger. I was very you know, young and I was like, all right, come on. Like I can make anybody strong. And then after having both sets of athletes, I have now changed that to say, give me the big, strong animal. Give me the big, strong animal. I'll, ru I'll ru you know, shave down the rough edges technically. I'll make them better technically to a point. They may not be perfect, but they're going to get enough out. And you just, it takes so much longer to develop that natural strength, that, that unbelievable strength. And then some kids, you just can't. You may be the most technically beautiful lifter in the world, and they're, at the end of the day, they're just not strong enough. Whereas you have this big, strong animal. If you look at the elites of the elites at the world and the Olympic level, they're freaks of nature. They can do things physically that other people can't do. You know, does the same bull have the best start out of the starting blocks? No, but he makes up for it because the guy is 6'5", and he's got these super long legs, and his, his, middle, his middle speed and his turnover and his top end speed are unbelievable. Some high-level Olympic weightlifters, some of them don't look the best technically, but they're just strong. They're super tough. And then you have this balance of both technique and unbelievable strength, and then it me meshes together and you have an unbelievable final product. You have a, a product that you want to use as an example for multiple generations. But you also got to look for those freaks. You got to find those freaks of nature out there that have that, okay? You got to go out there and you got to find them. Like I said, with these quantifiable measurables, can they jump high? Can they front squat heavy? Can they hold some ba basic positions? Are they tough? If you challenge them with a, ch a physical challenge, do they want to win? Or do they go, okay, I'm okay with just taking second or third? I don't want that person. I want the person that wants to win. I want the person that wants to bury the competitor, okay? I don't care if it's friggin' lifting weights or friggin' checkers. I want that attitude that they want to be better than the person next to them. Oh, I'll let Johnny win. I've won nine in a row. I'm gonna let Johnny win this time. Bullshit, you win 10 out of 10. You, you get that opportunity, you win, win 10 out of 10. Okay? Be a nice person on the side, but when it comes to competing, compete. Okay? Don't be you know, this soft person. So those are the things we're looking for. Those are the things that I'm looking for. And those are the things I think that if Team USA started to focus more on, unless, you know, kumbaya, you know, we would find those, that next generation putting forth, not just hoping they land in our lap, but going out and, and actively looking for those people. You know, part of the talent identification is, are they physically tough enough? Are they strong enough? Okay, can you teach them how to get better? Those are the things that we're looking for. You know, like I said, if you have that, you're gonna go far. Guys, any questions, please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. Any future topics you'd like to hear us talk about, um, we'd like to address it. Take care. <laughs>